my time, six o'clock your time. Ready to go? Let's do it. Bruno, you ready? I'm ready to go. All right. To everyone who is here, welcome to webinar number six, Functional Training Anatomy with myself, Kevin Carr, and Damian Perry. So translation is offered tonight. So if you go down to the bottom of your page, there's a little translation button. Bruno, our boy here, is going to be translating from English to Portuguese for and hello to all of our Brazilian friends. So make sure you switch that box to Portuguese and you can hear the translation while reading the slides and we are, we'll be nonstop talking for probably the next two hours. Uh, use the Q&A box only. So also at the bottom of your screen is gonna be a Q&A box. Do not use the chat box. Do not raise your hand. Uh, do not text us. Do not send us emails. We'll only answer questions in the Q&A box. Uh, and please try to make those questions relevant to what we're currently talking about. Uh, I'm Brendan Rierk. I'm going to be the facilitator of this <clears throat> webinar, but I'm also going to be a student because uh, Kevin wrote the book, which will be coming out soon on functional training anatomy, and Damien is going back to school to get his master's in biomechanics. So that makes me low on the totem pole. And from just our discussions this week, uh, Damien and Kevin have changed my mind about a bunch of things. So I will be the student along with all of you in facilitating this. Damien will speak about functional anatomy, what it is, and how it can be used to interpret movement and guide your coaching. Kevin will speak about defining both functional training and what functional anatomy is. And then he'll discuss how it's applied to training and we'll, he'll be using hamstrings, core, and single leg training as examples. Uh, we had over 1,100 people sign up for this webinar tonight. So thank you for being here. Uh, we have, I've picked 12 questions. I read about 500 of the questions. I did not read all 1,100, to be honest. That was a lot. Um, but I picked 12 of the most relevant questions that we will answer at the end here. Everyone will receive a post email with a recording of this and also a PDF of all of these slides. So if you have to leave early, go for it. You don't need to tell us, and you will get all the recordings for this. Uh, side note, we have five other webinars that we recorded. They are all free. Uh, they all have supporting materials as well. You'll get my email at the end if you want the supporting materials. Email me. We've done using your assessment to build a training program. We did integrative rehab and fitness, uh, business and career questions, Q&A with uh, Mike Boyle and Bob Hansen. We did nutrition behavior change and habit formation and then conditioning we did last week. So the what, the why, and the how. Next week's webinar will actually be with the three of us again. And next week we'll talk about how to read research. Uh, and I will also be the student again because I am not a big fan of reading research, but these two gentlemen are. So again, I will facilitate and learn along with all of you next week. Uh, right now, we're going to go Damien, Kevin, remember to ask your relevant questions in the Q&A box, and then we have 12 Q&As that I've extracted from all of your registration questions. Uh, anything you two want to add before we begin? No. I got right. plenty to add. That was perfect. You're a good facilitator. Ah, uh, thank yeah. you. I've been practicing. MC. This is MC number six. Brendan. Jenny says, don't tell me that because my head's going to swell to be too big to <laughs> on the Zoom camera. <laughs> All right, uh, Damien, I'm going to switch. Are you, can you share? Uh, 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 um, you should it still says I'm viewing yours. Yep. Let me stop yeah. share. Sorry. Okay, you should be good to go now. And I don't know how to do it. Blowing it. Oh, come on. You should have a button. Oh, my God. Blowing it. <laughs> I really don't know how to do it. Wow, this is terrible. Go. Oh, okay, there it is. Big the, green button. No big, green, big green button. Big green button. We're good to go. There we go. All right. <laughs> the big green button. Always the big green button. All right. You're up. 
Okay. Let's see. I need to press the play button. Press the play button. <laughs> okay. I got it that far. All right. So, uh, great start. Um, so, functional anatomy. I wanted to make this presentation pretty much as objective, free of opinions, and free of a lot of training stuff as possible, because I know that will lead into that as we get into questions and Kevin's discussion. Um, so, I want to treat this as sort of a view as if our clients were robots and we tell them to do something or we're assessing how they move. We're just going to view things to be pretty objective and we're going to try to clear away some of the biopsychosocial stuff or a lot of the other things that we would talk about in a different presentation. So let's start by just defining it. So in regards to what functional anatomy is, it's the study of the body components needed to achieve perform or a human motion function, whatever you want it to be. So the primary consideration is going to be that it's the movement produced. It's not, hey, you know, where's my leg? It's where my leg is moving, okay? Um, so these pictures down here, this is sort of our first anatomist. This was drawings by Vesalius who just, was the first guy who was, you know, tearing open bodies and letting people look at them. So um, really interesting stuff. If you want to look back at the archaic versions of what, you know, people learning anatomy is, you can look up some of those photos and uh, it's pretty funny. So uh, beginner's mind. I think this is an important concept to walk into anything you're doing, but especially in regards to learning something as complicated as anatomy. So I sort of laid this out here and, the version of how most people go through it, right? So especially if you've gone to school for something like this, you show up to class, they give you a book and they go, hey, go read this book, go learn some stuff. So your first priority is gonna be, hey, I need to pretty much memorize for the most part what's going on with a lot of this content. So it's reading books, making flashcards, using apps, going through some sort of material, but it's, it's sort of a passive level of consumption. You're just looking at it. There's no active component. You're not having to kind of put some skin in the game and get yourself out there and, and demonstrate this knowledge. The next step down, we're gonna go to something like hearing or seeing. So that's actually being in class. That's showing up to a cadaver lab or doing a dissection in your anatomy class. But pretty much at this point, that's where people sort of stop, right? School start, school stops, or you get done with your personal training certificate course or whatever it is. And then you're like, all right, cool, bro. Let's go do some lateral raises. And like, that's it. Like my shoulders are going to get blown up. They're going to be huge. And that's all I need to know about anatomy. Um, but so that's not good enough in regards to being a good trainer because you need to have critical thinking skills. Your client is not always going to be like the robot situation that I'm trying to create for you today they're going to have problems. They're going to go to do a squat and something's going to hurt and you're going to have to troubleshoot. You're going to have to figure out how to make changes on the run. And I think we at CFSC and MBSC and at Movement as Medicine, we do a good job changing directions and using lateralizations because we think critically about some of the things in front of us. Um, obviously not Brennan because he said he doesn't know any of this stuff, but at least me and Kevin do. All right. That's why I have you guys to rely on. I don't have to go past that white line. Oops. So the lens we're looking through. Uh, the thing with functional anatomy, and, and there was a lot of questions that, you know, Brendan sent some over earlier of like, why is this important? What is this? What goes on? The thing is with functional anatomy, it's like, you're not going to go get a bachelor's degree in functional anatomy. There's no, it doesn't exist. It is a sort of specific part of many domains of human movement. And that's sort of sort of the journey that I wanna take you through today is gonna to be, there's gonna be motor control aspects, there's gonna be anatomy aspects, there's gonna be biomechanic aspects. And then physiology, again, we're not, we're, we're dealing with robots today. It's just not of importance for this conversation, but obviously physiology and psychology and a whole other gang of stuff is very important to human movement, but it's just not what we're gonna focus on for this conversation. So, what are we gonna evaluate? How is movement programmed? What forces are acting on the body? What is moving? Where is it moving? So we're just gonna get a good grip on what our client would be doing for an exercise in front of us through the lens of these things of motor control anatomy and biomechanics. So sort of taking you to school here, movement 101. So simplification of gross anatomy. Uh, 
gross anatomy is going to be that Vesalius picture that we looked at in that first slide, right? It's going to be just who, what, where, when, why. There's a body on the table. There's our client in front of us, whether they're on the massage table or out in the gym floor, the muscle that what is it? You know, are we talking about a deltoid? We're talking about a pec minor like I have here. The origin and insertion, which I'll get into a little bit more of as we go, but where is it? Where does it start? Where does it end? What's, what's going on with this muscle? So we know what it is, we know where it is. And then the action, so what does it do? Um, and that's gonna be the big distinction that we're trying to maybe get across with this webinar is gonna be the action isn't necessarily what would be displayed if you had a cadaver in front of you, right? So your quad muscles don't just extend your knee, they do a whole lot more stuff but baseline anatomy in like a gross context is just going to say, hey, this quad muscle extends your knee. Cool. Uh, and then nerve innervation, blood supply, things like that. That's going to be the whens and the why. So what nerve innervates it, that's going to tell you kind of what motor program it's a part of. And I'm not going to get too into that today at all. But just regards to looking at an anatomy book and you see this picture like I have here with the pec minor like it's going to have origin, insertion, action, nerve supply. And these are going to things, they're going to be things that you're going to see in every textbook that you buy. So familiarizing yourself with to some degree why these things matter is a good start. So then simplification of motor control. So for today's purposes, I have taken the very complicated world of motor control and boiled it down to two things. So we're going to have an input happen. So that's Kevin saying, Hey, Arnold, I'm going to have you shoot this person, right? So input, that's, that's what happened. That was the stimulus. Okay. And then that's going to run through Arnold and it's going to come out on the other side and he's going to choose his response. He's going to say, am I going to shoot this person? Am I not going to shoot this person? What am I going to do? He's going to formulate this program inside of his computer. And then lastly, what we're going to be talking about today is going to be the movement programming aspect of all of this. So we're not going to get into the neurology of where movement comes from and patterns and, and habits and all these things that are in motor control, but we are going to talk about that end product. Uh, you just have to know that it came from somewhere in the central nervous system. These exercises don't just appear out of thin air, right? There's no just like, I'm going to pluck the squat program and put it in the drive. Like you have to generate some neural aspects of this moving along. So same model, but now we're gonna look at it through the lens of biomechanics. So there was some input, it went through Arnold, we have our gun shooting selection of movement. Now we have kinematics and kinetics. So just to simplify these definitions, where is the body moving in space and how fast is it going? So for today's purposes, I don't, we're not gonna talk about how fast things are moving, we're just gonna talk about the movements themselves, but where the body is moving in space is what's relevant of this conversation. And then what internal and external forces are acting upon the body while moving? So in biomechanics, if I have you running on a treadmill or on a force plate or doing something like that, we're going to measure forces in regards to gravity and Newtons and you stomping the floor and you doing all those sort of things. But for today's purposes, the forces that we're going to talk about are just going to be position based, right? So if you're laying on the ground, the forces on your body are going to be very different than when you're standing up. So it's kind of just zooming out on what functional anatomy is from a viewpoint. We're looking at a, a very stripped down view of a movement assessment from the world of biomechanics. And then to get to our functional anatomy. So stripping pieces and parts from those other two aspects that I already talked about, we're in the output section, right? So what muscles acted to create this pattern of movement and what plane of motion did they occur in? That's our primary kind of thing we're looking at here today is going to be what's going on with the body, all right? How is this person moving? Are they laying on the ground and doing a sit-up? Are they standing up and squatting down or are they standing up and doing something in the open chain in which their legs off the floor and they're doing a donkey kick or whatever other random exercise you can pull off Instagram, all right? So that's how you're gonna start to assess movement is going to be through some of this lens of patterns and planes of motion and stance and all those sorts of things that are gonna allow you to just classify and quantify what's happening. So muscular considerations, to move out of sort of just this movement 101 category, we're gonna to start to look at what's happening with each muscle, all right? So in, mo in movement, 
there's going to be an agonist, the muscle that creates the desired joint movement. So in this case, we've taken Arnold out of the world of Terminator and we're, we're back in the gym with Arnold. And so if you can see his massive deltoids are creating this lateral raise, all right? Then the antagonist is going to be the opposing muscle group. So something like in this case, it would be his lat, and I'll go over it briefly in a second here, but something that's going to oppose the movement so that way he doesn't throw those dumbbells to the ceiling. He has something that opposes and checks his forces so that way he doesn't injure himself and he controls the rate of force development and things like that. And then there's gonna be a stabilizer. So there has to be something to allow this movement to happen in a very clean and concise way. So as he's moving, what is moving? His scapula is gonna move, his glenarcumeral joint's gonna move. He has to control his body in different forces. So there's gonna be stabilizing forces from different muscles happening in different directions. And then there's some sort of synergist or neutralizer. So every different muscle in the body has this kind of list similar to that kind of origin insertion and action list of things that it does and each movement has this sort of system of checks and balances so to sort of review this it's just going to be something that helps to control or stabilize your movement and kind of like a checks and balance system as i mentioned so for this particular exercise just to start to use some real life examples the agonist would be his deltoid, as I said, his massive deltoids are raising that muscle up. Most people can get that part. So then as I got into a little bit, your latissimus dorsi here, that's gonna check that movement upward. Because if he uses a three pound dumbbell and he bruises it as fast as he can, he has to have something that's going to check the speed or at least control the joint through space so that way it stays centered in the socket of the joint. And controls the rate of force so that way it doesn't kind of create an injury or a problem or anything like that. Again, another stabilizing action is going to be his trapezius. So I mentioned upward rotation from his scapula is going to be what happens to create that movement upward, right? The shoulder doesn't move by itself. The scap has to come along with it. So what's on the other side of that scapula? That's going to be a trapezius muscle. A big, huge trap is going to help control that scapula up in space. All right. And then the neutralizer, this is sort of the tricky one and it's a little bit nuanced, but the secondary action of something like your latissimus is internal rotation of your glenohumeral joint, right? So it's going to turn that arm in. So if he's trying to just lift it straight up to the side, his teres minor is going to act into play. So teres minor being a um, muscle of the back side of the shoulder, right? It's going to be just a rotator cuff muscle. It's going to help check that internal rotation and keep that arm moving in the way that his brain has said, hey, we want you to move straight up and down, all right? So that's kind of this integration of motor control is gonna send out signals to all of these muscles, and then we see the final product of massive Arnold doing shoulder raises in the gym. So next, we have muscle considerations of actions, okay? So you just talked about what muscles we're doing and now how, how do they move? Like what is happening? So if we use the example of now just simple elbow flexion, elbow flexion being bicep curl for making things simple and making our biceps bigger, right? So concentric action of a bicep curl is going to be flexing that elbow, right? So Concentric action, net muscle forces produce movement in the same direction as the change in joint angle. So the change in joint angle is closing on the inside of your elbow. Your bicep is performing this action. And then eccentric, so lowering down. So the net muscle forces produce movement in the opposite direction of the change in joint angle. So why this is important is going to be in your anatomy textbook, it's going to say that your tricep extends your your elbow right if we look into an anatomy book it's going to say tricep it's going to extend this joint but in a bicep curl it's pretty obvious and most of us know as trainers that there's an eccentric control action going on with your bicep right so your bicep now is working eccentrically to help control that dumbbell back to your side and help you get the pump right and then lastly, the isometric action is going to just be muscle is active and develops tension with no visible change. So maybe that's you do a bicep curl, but you stop three quarters of the way up and you just stare at your biceps and you see your veins just blasting through your arm. 
that's going to be that isometric pause in any sort of exercise that you would typically do in the gym. So the important takeaway that I want you to take here is that concept of concentric and eccentric relationships. So to take it to a different area, if say we're doing a squat, the lowering portion through global muscles of your lower limb is going to be eccentric, right? That's going to slow you down from going butt to the floor. The concentric action is going to push you back up and away. And isometric would be pausing in the middle and stopping yourself completely. I'm going to elaborate a little bit more on this as we get through this, but this is our general sort of start point for considering what's happening with a muscle. So where we now get into, and this is where probably the bread and butter of why I think this presentation is important, is going to be the fact that muscles don't work by the book when it comes to something like a closed chain activity. So if we're discussing something like running, so Prefontaine, who is my hair and mustache motivation uh, on this picture on the right here, he's running around a track doing his thing. But if we start to evaluate running, and I'm not going to go into a full biomechanical analysis about running, but we would say, okay, running, that involves the legs. What happens with the legs? Oh, well, your quads extend your knee, your hamstrings flex at your knee, uh, your abs crunch you forward, your back extends you back. Like clearly those things are not happening for him to run. There's going to be this nice synergistic combination of isometric and concentric and eccentric activities that's gonna allow him to move step to step. So eccentric, what's gonna happen? That's our lowering and our breaking. So our quads aren't just working to extend our knee. Our quads are now working to slow us down from going and falling on the floor with each step. Running is just a lot of falling over and over again. I know I run a lot and it's just basically just catching yourself from falling on your face over and over again. It's not that fun. But so that's your lowering and your, your breaking aspect. The next is gonna be your isometric. So in this case, it allows for elastic tendon use. So before when we were talking about bicep curls, you curl up, you stop in the middle, you admire your biceps, and then you eccentric the lower back down. But in regards to something dynamic like running, we create an isometric contraction of our calves to allow for our Achilles tendon to do what an Achilles tendon likes to do, which is snap and help us elastically bounce to the next step. Running, people can run for 10, 20, 50, 100 miles, not like we're doing bicep curls. You get tired. But in running, we will use brief isometric contractions that allow tendons to just snap back and forth and throw us step to step. And then obviously concentric, that's once that kind of snapping action is over, you, you push back off, you get to your next step. All right. Um, and then dynamic stabilization, this, this last piece is probably one that people miss. This is going to be control in three dimensions. So just because running is primarily just forward doesn't mean that the muscles of the lateral hip are just completely uninvolved in running. As most runners would know, or, or many exercise in regards to any sport, it's like, wow, my TFL, my glute meat are so sore from like going on that run or running all those sprints or doing whatever. They control for long periods of time as a stabilizing activity. So just because he's running forward, every time his foot lands, he has to stabilize left to right. It's not just I'm lowering myself up and down like I'm doing leg extensions. There's a lot more that goes into play when it comes to these muscle groups. So considerations of attachment, I touched on this briefly just to show you a picture of it because it's gonna matter as I get a little bit more nuanced. So origin being closer to the midpoint of the body and insertion being further from the midpoint of body. So something like your hamstrings, if we're looking at from the pelvis down here, the origin of your hamstring group is going to go to your ischial tuberosity, and then we're going to insert down on sort of the pes anserines, tib medial tib, long head of the femur, fibula, what, you know, it, it doesn't matter. Fibula. I almost slipped up there. Uh, okay. um, fibula. That does not, it's not even a bone. <laughs> the combination of a femur and a <laughs> fibula. That's not even a bone. Okay. Fibula. So, um, so that's just going to be what we have to evaluate in regards to if you don't know where muscles are attaching or going, then you're going to have a tough time assessing 
what's going on with them. So as a massage therapist on both Kevin Brennan and myself's part, this is a pretty important skill to have of knowing where things go, right? Everybody can just be like, yeah, my hamstring, back of my legs. Cool. You need to know where that thing goes because if there's a problem or you're trying to troubleshoot an issue, you need to know where that muscle's going because that's going to dictate the direction of the fibers. So if fibers are directed not straight up and down, things are often at angles and twisting and turning and moving in all sorts of different directions. So you can tell a lot about a muscle by the orientation of their fibers and just having a basic knowledge of what this stuff is. Now granted, you can look in the book and just reference it whenever you need to, but as you get into a little bit more of a dynamic situation of having to make decisions on the fly with a client, you need to have a better idea of what these maybe are and at least some of the major muscle groups. Real quick, are um, you going to discuss fiber orientation, either of you? Not, in a, I mean, in regards to what? So do you mind just kind of explaining for everybody uh, how the muscle or why the muscle is laid down in the orientation that it is because of force? Yeah. So, I mean, in regards to let's, let's evaluate uh, just to go to a different muscle group, let's say the calf, because I already brought up the Achilles, right? So the group of your calf, so your gastroc and your soleus, they're lined straight up and down, right? If you're looking at somebody, those fibers are, are pretty oriented straight up and down, and then they run into your Achilles tendon at the, the ankle, right? So we're oriented straight up and down because those muscle fibers are creating movements straight up and down. So if we're doing something like a calf raise or something like running where we're going forward and backward, the orientation of those are going to be what helps to dictate the primary action of those muscles versus something like uh, our obliques, which are oriented down at an angle on our sides, they're going to help to control rotation. So their orientation is going to dictate a lot of what functions in regards to what they do because when they contract, they don't, they don't, they're not like, oh, Brendan wants me to move one way, but I, I only know how to move this way. So I'm just going to do whatever I want to do. So that's going to be obliques fire. They turn you to a side. Calves fire. They send you forward or they send you up. So that, that fiber type orientation is going to be what helps to dictate the action that happens in your body. Cool. Thank you. And that, do you have, any, do think... you have anything on that? Yeah, Kevin, you have anything to add? No, it's not that was perfect. Um, and, and I know that a lot of people always have questions when it comes to like the fascia conversation, which is, is not something I wanted to make this presentation about, but fascia is going to be something that's going to impact those fiber type orientations and things like that, because fascia is going to influence kind of like the positions of things and the lines of tug and all that sort of stuff. So not to make, not to turn this into a fascia talk, but just to say that fascia is going to help to influence some of those directions because fascia is basically an extension of those soft tissue structures like your Achilles tendon and other sort of stretchy fiber types. All right. Bang. Uh, positional consideration. So uh, we have sagittal plane, frontal plane, and transverse plane. So looking at sort of a, just assessing this objectively, sagittal plane, it's that middle plane cutting straight through the body. It runs forward and backward, dividing our body right to left. So the movements that are responsible in the sagittal plane are going to be something like flexion extension, dorsiflexion, and plantar flexion. So if we think about the muscles that are going to be involved in the sagittal plane, actually great segue off of what I was just talking about, things that are oriented straight up and down on our body are going to help to control the sagittal plane. So what are we talking about there? Quads, hamstrings, right? If we're squatting, that's very sagittal plane oriented movement because those fibers are directed up and down in the direction of that sagittal plane. It's going to move us into flexion extension. At the calves, it's gonna be dorsiflexion, plantar flexion, things like that. Secondly, the frontal plane, so that's cutting us front and back. It's, it's sliding through the side of us. Um, and by doing that, what movements are gonna be classified in this plane? That's gonna be abduction, adduction, lateral flexion, things that are controlling us left to right, okay? So that lateral raise that I showed before of Arnold having the dumbbells hoisted up, 
he's moving in the frontal plane because he's abducting his arm, all right? And then the last one, uh, the more elusive sort of transverse plane, this one sort of combines a lot of movements from a lot of different places. There's not much that's ever gonna be truly just rotational because so much flexion, extension, and other movements have to come into play here. But when you're thinking transverse plane, it's, it's chopping us in half at the waist. So it's moving in a, in a different orientation than the other two planes. And if we think about something like rotation, pronation, supination, it's gonna be things that turn our body. So here, like a lateral med ball toss or something that's going to completely orient us on that plane that's chopped right through the middle. Um, and I know that when I was kind of a fresh, young exercise science student, staring at this, I get a little bit confused as I was learning it because it's like, all right, it chops the body right to left for the sagittal plane. Isn't that mean we move right to left? But you have to just look at the orientation of those panes that are cutting through our little uh, RoboCop there and uh, just imagine that, okay, that plane moves forward and backward. So things that are mattering in this are going to move forward and backward, up and down. Basic kind of primal movements like squatting, deadlifting are bigger exercises. And then we get into the frontal plane, it's going to be a little bit less. You're not going to be able to abduct a house right? It's going to, you can, you can deadlift a lot of weight, but abduction and adduction movements are going to be a little less force developing and a little bit more on this kind of lighter movement plane because the muscle groups are not as large. And then lastly, that transverse plane, that's your athleticism sort of stuff, right? So that's chopping right through our middle. It's rotating us in space. It's going to be stuff that helps develop, you know, sort of those athletic movements, like I mentioned before, something like a med ball toss. So this is where things get, start to get spicy. We start to classify things up a little bit. So movement programming. So I'm, I'm using some terms that I kind of had highlighted earlier in the presentation. So as we start to classify these things, they start to fit into boxes. So I know Brendan loves things like checklists. So I tried to make some <laughs> lists for Brendan so that he didn't get too confused. <laughs> but this is our basic CFSC model, right? We have knee dominant exercises, hip dominant exercises, unilateral and bilateral for both of those, right? So we're gonna have things that are a little bit more oriented towards using one thing or the other in regards to hip and knee dominant. Upper body push, upper body pull, horizontal and vertical. We can go up and down, we can go forward and backward. It's gonna vary on what you need and what you're trying to fill for a bucket. Anti-extension, anti-lateral flexion, anti-rotation. So those movements are gonna be our movements that are starting to get into the frontal plane on those anti-lateral flexions. And then anti-rotation, obviously that's gonna be transverse stuff. Uh, anti-extension obviously being kind of more sagittal plane. So we have this kind of segue of activities that start to fit into certain buckets. And then I have locomotion jumping and throwing and italics over there because they're sort of special unicorns in that they combine a lot of different stuff. You know, going for a run is not going to be as easy as I flex and extend for 45 minutes and then I go home. There's going to be a lot of transfer of, of force and, and using different planes of motion. Same thing with jumping and throwing. So then going down another layer, now we get to we're going to choose a pattern. Right, so we're gonna either be doing some sort of flexion moment or extension movement or adduction or abduction or rotation. These decisions are gonna be where we're worrying about plane of motion, right? So something that's more flexion extension based, like say a squat or moving up and down, that is going to be a sagittal plane activity. And then you can just start to choose, okay, abduction, adduction, that's gonna fill in this bucket. So we start to boil things down one step at a time. And then again, the plane of motion, like I'm saying, I, I'm speaking in front of my own slides, like I don't know what they are, but, and then lastly, moment of force. So this is sort of, I'm dumbing down biomechanics in regards to the, the force vectors on the body to the easiest way that we can control this in a gym setting without having to care about force outside of what weight we're putting on a bar is going to be what position we put people in, right? So supine is gonna have very different forces then side-lying and prone. And then when we stand people up to tall kneeling, half kneeling, or, or full standing, gravity is going to be acting as our primary force vector, and it's going to be changing what's happening with our body. It's much easier to control your abs in a supine position because you're laying out on the floor versus in a standing position where there's more stuff involved, all right? 
So this is sort of the, the mecca of like, how am I gonna choose to design a program? Well, this is the functional anatomy version of that. This is me dumbing everything down into a very quantifiable bucket that you can just pluck and pull and put everything in to classify what decisions you're making in the gym. What doesn't fit into this is you standing on one leg on a BOSU ball, patting yourself on the head, rubbing yourself on the stomach, and jump roping at the same time. That's, it's nonsense. So that's why we have this system that we can put things into certain places, and it allows for very quantifiable movements, but it also allows us to progress and regress in a very systematic manner that follows a line with this functional anatomy concept or these biomechanics concepts. So to make it some real life application of, of maybe some certain exercises, we have this list of stuff here. So a push up, a kettlebell deadlift, a single leg squat, a lateral med ball toss, and an adductor side plank. All right. So what are we worried about first? All right, we're push up, that's a that's a push. Kettlebell deadlift, it's hip dominant. A squat, that's gonna be knee dominant. Lateral med ball toss, that's gonna be in our throwing kind of category. And then adduction, that's gonna be anti-lateral flexion, right? So that's that's pretty simple. And then we can add the second layer onto it. So orientation, push up, we're gonna be pushing, that's a horizontal pushing movement. Kettlebell deadlift, that's a bilateral stance. Single leg squat, that's a unilateral stance. Lateral med ball toss, that's sort of like a change of direction. We're gonna have this sort of lateral staggered sort of stance. And then adductor side plank is, just like we're standing up and down on one leg, it's a unilateral movement. It's just, we've changed the lever of force, okay? And then movement pattern. So push up, we're just moving up and down. Flexion, extension, flexion, extension. It's very sagittal plane movement. Uh, same thing with the deadlifts, right? So flexion, extension, we're just moving straight up and down, sagittal plane. Where things start to get a little spicy is gonna be, as soon as you stand on one leg, there are now force vectors that take you outside of just the sagittal plane because you have to stand on one leg, which requires some more stabilization from joints that are involved, or muscles, I should say, that are involved in the frontal plane, okay? So I have a slide about that. We'll talk a little bit more about it. Lateral med ball toss, that's a transverse plane. That's purely rotational, it's athletic movement. And then our adductor side plane, that's gonna be that pure frontal plane. Everything's left to right. So remember that slide of it cuts sideways through that guy's head, everything being left to right for that adductor side plane. I won't call it, what is it called? Uh, what country is that one named after? Which one? Oh, the Copenhagen? Yeah, Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Whatever country, Copenhagen. yeah, whatever, dude. It's this adductor side plane. Um, and then that force vector, so our, just our position to make it simple, push up, we're in a prone position. Kettle the deadlift, we're standing. Single leg squat, we're standing. And this is gonna help to quantify like, hey, what joints are going to be involved in this equation when I start trying to do a little functional anatomy math for myself to decide on movements. Um, so integration of concepts. We have an old school Kevin Carr short hair picture. So I figured I wanted to put that, that in there because I have the long hair compared to my short hair biopic. <laughs> I wanted to show off Kevin's short hair picture. Look at the you know, old Adidas. Close. He looks like a good athlete back then. <laughs> <laughs> Almost looks like stuff. he could do stuff. So I just dragged and dropped over our, our single leg squat section from that last slide. So again, it's a knee dominant exercise. We're standing on one leg. We're moving up and down, so flexion and extension, but we're stabilizing in adduction and abduction. So left to right has to stabilize us onto that leg. Um, so sagittal frontal, and then we're standing up. We have, that means we're gonna have a hip involved, we're gonna have a torso involved, we're gonna have a knee, we're gonna have an ankle, we're gonna have the full spectrum of everything involved. We're not able to chop any joints out by reducing them for something like kneeling. So unpacking, because I love the word unpacking. We had a discussion about this the other day. Um, unpacking the single leg squat. So it's a knee dominant exercise. It's in the sagittal plane. We're standing up, things I already just said, right? So these are all the involved sort of joints. The agonist, to take us back to where we were talking about before. So our quadriceps are our primary movers here. They are what's taking control of the motion. The, motion. the antagonists are gonna be the hamstrings. They're just gonna kind of be there to help check our movement and control from the other side. 
they're not going to pull us down though right they're just going to check the movement so that the quadriceps are going to eccentrically pull us down or pull kevin down in this case to that bench okay and then the synergist what's working along with the quadriceps to help us get back up is going to be our glute max okay so at the end of the day the squat is a quadriceps oriented movement we're working on our quads when we do squats you're going to, you might feel some glutes, you might feel some hamstrings because they are working hard to help stabilize and control our movement. But at the end of the day, as you mostly should know, if you're a coach, you probably work out, you feel your quads after a squat day, especially something like a single leg squat day, you're going to feel your quads. So then bringing in the unilateral portion of this, we have to stabilize in the frontal plane, right? So if I just try to stand up on two legs, like I'm standing up on one leg, I'm going to fall sideways, right? So as soon as you stand on one leg, what happens? Things like our medial arch of our foot turn on. Things like our adductors and our glute meds and everything that are working left to right start to turn on to help us stay over there. So our synergist for this movement is gonna be our adductor magnus because what's gonna pull us over the top of that leg that Kevin is standing on? our adductor right it's on the inside of our leg our adductor is going to pull us over to help orient us to be straight up and down over that leg that's doing the squatting and then the stabilizer of what's going to help keep them there is going to be our lateral glutes right so our glute med glute min they live on the side of our body and they're going to help stabilize at the pelvis to help kevin move straight up and down so that he can use those sagittal plane muscles that are the big movers while he goes up and down. So stabilization in the frontal plane while he moves up and down. That second portion is probably the biggest thing that people miss from an entire standpoint of assessing movement, knowing what muscles are working. It's easy once you start to unpack it, quote unquote. But when it comes to being able to dictate changes and exercises for your clients, or me as a therapist, or these guys as a therapist, if somebody comes over and says like, oh, like I feel this while I'm running, or this hurts me while I'm squatting, if you don't know the whole picture of what's happening, then you're gonna have some deficits in your game. Because you're just like, I don't know, bro, go squat. It's quads, whatever. I don't wanna talk about it. They're, they're gonna have pain, they're gonna have problems. And if they're feeling a pinching in the front side of their hip, or they're feeling really tightness on the side of their hip, you're going to, if you know these things that I'm talking about, you are going to be able to think very critically about how to help your client. It doesn't even have to be about pain, how to help optimize their movement, right? So maybe it's an exercise that you help pair with a certain exercise so that they feel things better, right? So maybe it's that adductor side plank to help them feel their adductors to help pull them over to the leg so that they can single leg squat better. So you can start to build exercise programs in a very succinct fashion around these ideas if you know what muscles are working and in which fashions, right? And this is, you know, maybe being more complicated than what it needs to be in many cases. But at the end of the day, if this is your craft, you should probably know what the person in front of you is doing. And granted, you know, people ask, in the gym all the time, like, dude, can I like shadow you while you like train your clients? I'm like, yeah, well, I'm just gonna make fun of them the whole time and we're just gonna like shoot the shit. But in the back of my head, I know what's happening in front of me because this is, this is on the back of my hand, it's there, right? So if you're having to like put it through your brain waves of like, oh gosh, what muscles are working and what pa patterns and this is something that you need to know on the back of your head. So that way you can just talk to your client and give them a good experience. But as soon as they tell you, hey, like my inside of my leg hurts while I do this exercise, you can go, uh, that probably means there's a problem going on with that lateral plane while they're trying to do the single leg squat. Let's, let's talk about that. Let's try to figure it out, okay? So now this is where it starts to get really spicy in terms of putting things into motion because it's going to take all those concepts. You needed to have everything from before what I just talked about for this all to start to make sense for you. But I'm going to do my best to just break it down and hopefully you can just rewatch this 30 times and then go read books and then you'll get it as well. It's not going to be that complicated. I'm just kidding. So, um, 
body position, right? So if you've taken CFSC course, we have an entire motor control section in which you talk about orienting what's going on with our rib cage and our pelvis. So I have like a bowl here and a bowl here. We want things to stack on top of one another. So body position and respiration influence position of our rib cage and pelvis. So I have three different bland people over here. One of them is in a quote unquote neutral position in the front there. Secondly, we have someone who's opened up on the front side. And lastly, we have someone who's opened up on the back side. So knowing what's happened with a lot of the things that I've discussed, what, what do we start to have to evaluate? The position of the rib cage and pelvis is going to influence the muscle origin and insertions, right? So I had a section talking about where is stuff, right? This is what functional anatomy is about, knowing where the stuff is. So if we have a position that is out of a neutral position, and that word neutral is very kind of up for debate, but any sort of inkling of something that is up and down, and you know when it's not straight up and down and relatively neutral because you see it. Um, but we're going to get some images of this stuff. And this is not the only example I could ever make, but it's a, it's a very useful one for the sake of this application. So what happens with our bland person that was opened on the front side? So we open up the angle on the front side and we close down the angle on the back side. And compare that to our neutral person up over there where things are a little bit more straight up and down. If we tilt the pelvis forward, our legs still have to stand on the floor, correct? We're not just gonna tip up on our toes. So our legs are still gonna be straight up and down on the floor. So that means we're tilting the pelvis relative to our femur, okay? So we're gonna get some changes that are going on at the pelvis relative to our leg. And we're also getting these changes that are going on at the rib cage, all right? So abs eccentric. So I talked about eccentric contractions before. That means that it was a lengthening contraction, right? So with this position, whether they're stuck there all the time, or maybe just for a little bit of time, like when they like when they work out, they like to get into this big extension based position because, you know, they power lift or something like that. That's how they lift their weights. Well, their abs are going to be stretched out into this kind of eccentric lengthened position. They're going to they're just going to stay there. So if you think about abs being in an eccentric position they're not gonna have a very good time contracting because they're pulled and stretched beyond their, their kind of zone of work, right? They're not gonna work too well because they're too stretched out. They're like an elastic band that was stretched too far and now is just stuck in that position. Hip flexors, in contrast to that, so we lengthen the abs on the front side, what are we doing? We're tipping the hips forward relative to that leg and now our hip flexors are gonna be stuck in a concentric orientation. So we've shortened them. Right, so we talked about before with the bicep curl, concentric, we're shortening those fibers. Well, now hip flexors are in this shortened position. So, you know, all the time people are like, oh, my hip flexors are tight, my hip flexors are tight. This kind of picture here starts to paint some of that for you in regards to being a coach or a practitioner. Then on the back side, we close down that back angle, right? So our lumbar paraspinals, they're really concentrically held tight. They're not having a good time because they're doing a lot of work to keep you standing up, right? They're clamping down hard. So when people are like, ah, my low back hurts all the time. Well, it's probably because your abs are locked in this position where they can't work too well and your back is in a position in which it is overworking, all right? And this is a very hyper simplification of all of these concepts. This is not gonna go completely in depth about all of this. Um, but the basics of it are gonna be, look, those paraspinals, they're shortened up. That means they're clamped down to hold that position. And then lastly, one of the more important things that you know, people can get is gonna be with the tipping of that pelvis forward, hamstrings are gonna be locked now in that same sort of eccentric orientation that we just had similar to the abs, right? So you're taking the origin point of that hamstring and you are stretching it out by tipping your hips forward. All right, so by tipping your hips forward, we're pulling the hamstring attachment at our pelvis. And now when someone says, oh, my hamstrings are tight all the time, it's like, well, they're not tight. There's no like magical little elf in there pulling it tight. What you've done is put on like a pre-stretch that is telling your brain back in our motor control world, hey, your hamstrings are really tight, all right? So all of this is just now really getting into the sort of deeper layers of how you can use functional anatomy 
because you can now use this as a practitioner to say, well, if this person presents like this when they walked in my door, I know that I can now say, all right, well, we need to get a little bit more concentric orientation for the abs. And we need to get a little bit more eccentric orientation of our hip flexors. And then vice versa on the backside, we need to get our hamstrings to work. That way they're not stuck in that stretched out position. So you can make a lot of decisions as a practitioner or a coach just based off of orientations of people without having to put them on your massage therapy table and assess them, right? You can simply just go, they're presenting with this, this sort of thing that I see, and I'm going to make some, some blanket judgment calls to say, I'm going to do some planks with them to help turn their abs on, and I'm going to do some hamstring activation drills, and that's probably going to clean a lot of stuff up, all right? And then I just had these highlighted here, right? Because in regards to people with neck pain and people with tight hamstrings and back pain and things like that, we eyes our eyes are always going to be set on the horizon. Our head isn't just going to tilt forward or backward with us. It's going to change its orientation relative to whatever's going on down at the bottom there. So just remember that things connect in our joint by joint approach kind of model. If we can change what's going on in the middle, we're probably going to clean up the things that happen on either side. So a lot of times for a client, if they have neck pain, I'm looking at the rib cage, or if they have back pain, I'm looking at what's happening with their pelvis. All right. So now if we can reanalyze using maybe some of these concepts to think, Hey, how do we put all this picture together? All right. And we have this wonderful picture of Steve Bigelow over there, just flexing about to do a deadlift. Um, we have our kettlebell deadlift. So it's a hip dominant exercise. It's bilateral and stance. They're just moving basically in flexion and extension. He's in the sagittal plane. We're going to wrap all these things together to create this troubleshooting effect of saying, what the hell is actually happening here? Okay. So troubleshooting with flexional anatomy, flexional. I like that though. Flexional. New word. Uh, too. Functional, functional anatomy. So my client, Steve here, my hamstrings are really tight when I try to bend down and pick up this kettlebell. This hurts my back being in this position. So if we think about, we just saw, if Steve presented in a position of, of resting posture with things oriented in certain ways and me knowing my anatomy, I know that, all right, well, I know where things attach and I know how they work and I know these concentric and eccentric variables and I know what muscles are going to work in this exercise. I can just break this down without even having to do anything really in depth and hopefully it makes a difference, right? So bilateral sagittal plane. We're going to be using things like hamstrings, glute max, and abs. So his abs are going to lock in and just kind of hold them in there. His hamstrings are going to lower them down eccentrically. And then his hamstrings and his glutes are going to push him back up tall. I know what he should feel, right? So in my head, I already have that. I'm not guessing at it. And I say, hey, Steve, what did you feel there? And then he gives me the response of my hamstrings are really tight. I feel like I can't move. My back hurts. Well, we know that's incorrect. But if I say, hey, Steve, what do you feel? He goes, oh, hamstrings are lit up and my glutes are really working there at the top. It's like, okay, cool, move on. We know we're doing something at least mostly right. So our intervention in this case, knowing what should be working, how do we change their starting position to be a little bit more neutral? If Steve was like that person on that last slide, how do we get his pelvis to tip back and his ribs to come down? Well, if you take a CFSC course, whether it be online or in person, um, you're going to learn all about that, right? So it's going to be, hey, what are some exercises that are going to help turn on the hamstrings, help turn on the abs, and help create this more neutral position for this person so that they have a new experience and a new position? And then, so again, there's motor controls. So recommended reading. So just before I re get into this reading stuff here, I just wanted to say that sort of all of this stuff can be broken down and if you know it in the back of your head, you get to just look at your client moving and make these decisions. You don't need to be looking at charts. So if we think all the way back to that learning slide that I started with here, you need to go beyond just what your book says. And you guys are already doing that by tuning into something like this presentation. So you're taking those next steps, but now it, it just means showing up to more stuff, watching more webinars, whatever that may be, that you put yourself with a little skin in the game. So that way you actually have to demonstrate these qualities okay so recommended reading everything that's all i got just kidding but 
uh, Biomechanical Basis of Human Movement. That's by Joe Hamill out of UMass Amherst and a few of his colleagues. Essential Clinical Anatomy by Moore. And then Evidence Informed Muscle Manual by Visniak. So all of those uh, are a little bit beyond just like Gray's Anatomy. Here's what's where. They'll help you to start to piece together some of what's happening in regards to human movement that takes you a little beyond, you know, my biceps flex my arm. All right. So if you need me, Instagram, email, send me questions. I'm sure we're going to talk about all the questions on here though in a four hour webinar. All right. I just want to give you a little round of applause there. <laughs> well done. Thanks, B. A whole hour. Well uh, done. I loved it. Thanks for um, I, I wouldn't expect any less out of Damien. No, me. Thank either. you for doing heavy lifting. Honestly, I blacked out just like the winter seminar. So <laughs> no, that was great. And I mean, I, I would say those are all things that I've seen before or that I know about, but I've never organized them in that fashion. Uh, and more specifically the, the planes of movement that you use there. Um, I've done obviously the buckets of uh, hip dominant, knee dominant and all that, but not putting it in buckets of sagittal plane action. Yeah. Stuff, yeah, 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 yeah. Stuff like that. Um, so we got a couple good questions. So Jim and, uh, oh, I don't know where that other question went, but Jim asked, would you prioritize planes of movement and programming based on an athlete's deficiencies or the demands of the sport? Um, I think there's two well, answers to this. And I'll yeah, I was just going to say there's, so in regards to, how we operate at the gym and through CFSC, right? It's like you already wrote your program. So when you write your program, you're trying to check all the boxes of creating efficient movement in all the planes, right? So that's why we have med ball stuff to get rotational power. That's why we have med ball stuff to get linear and sagittal plane power. And that's why we have lateral squats versus regular. Like we're trying to check that box in our programs already. But if somebody shows up in front of you with a clear deficit, then yeah, like you, you have to work on that. And that's usually going to be like for my own personal programming, it's like a block is a one, a two, a three. And a three is always going to be something like a core drill or something that's going to help to promote or better their deficiencies. Um, and then the second piece of that I would say is to like, if they're a power lifter, then like, no, you just want to make them as sagittal as possible because all they want to do is lift shit up and down. They don't care about, going out and playing golf that much, you know? So that's what's gonna just depend on, on the person in front of you in terms of what you decide. Yeah, so. And kind of going off of that, there, there was another question that was similar that I think I answered in the chat, um, asking like, hey, do we wanna check every single plane off every single day and do we do that in a warm up? Do we do that in a lift? And I think from a logistical standpoint, it's important to think about the client that you're working with because uh, for many beginners, it starts with sagittal plane competency first, because you need to have some sort of sagittal plane competency before you can have control in the frontal and transverse plane. So if you think about what that means, like if I had like a 70 year old client come in, I'm not going to start loading them in the frontal plane in the transverse plane. It's probably asking for trouble, uh, but getting them to get strong in the sagittal plane, like a goblet squat, understanding how to do a plank understanding an incline push-up and then maybe in the warm-up starting to introduce some unloaded um, front plane or unloaded transverse plane movements as they get stronger in the sagittal plane introduce those things in the weight room so it, it's really on a spectrum and what you'll find is often sagittal plane competencies come first and then you move in that direction um, but for our general pop clients you you kind of want to introduce them to all of these things as they progress through the program uh, but it'll really be specific to the type of client and what their goals are. Like Damien used the, ex the ad extreme example of a power lifter. They don't need, a, in fact, the specificity, we're going to go further down sagittal plane for them than we are anything else. Um, whereas with most athletes, it's going to be multi-planar. Yeah, I would add that. So the two answers for me are there's training a human being to be healthy, which means you want to hit all the movement patterns. Yeah. So there, there's health. First, and health always is the priority because if you're not healthy, I don't care what sport you play, you can't play the sport. So we're doing all of the patterns all of the time and the specificity part comes to, so a, a hockey player would be considered more frontal plane because they're doing more of that activity. So maybe we would wanna do a little bit more frontal plane stuff, but 
for me, everything falls in that 80, 20 bucket, 80% of people just need to be healthy. So therefore we're going to spend, or 80% of athletes programs need to just be health based, which you will hit all of your movement patterns. And then 20% of your sport is different, right? You're still, you're still dealing with a human being. We all have uh, the same movement patterns that Damien has gone through. We all move in similar planes. Uh, we all have a cardiovascular system, a nervous system, a respiratory system, a lymphatic system. So therefore you've got to train the group of people first and then only 20% of your sport is different. So you're not going to, you're not going to create this crazy program that's completely different from somebody else because they play a different sport. A healthy human is a healthy human. So that's why I, for me, there's two different answers. There's, there's health and then there's the performance piece, but you're mostly going to spend your time trying to get people good at all the movements. Um, and yeah, I mean, like you said, Damien, the 20% of people who want to only power lift. I mean like Kevin's client or, and formerly Brennan, you know, Jim Minucci, he, he lives in the sagittal <laughs> plane. He just waddles around, does his squats and his pre his pushups and leaves. And he's an older dude, but he's very healthy. He can just live in that sagittal plane and he's fine because he doesn't need to do anything special. Right. But if you have a 16-year-old a baseball player that comes in, like they're, they're going to need to spend more time on things that are more challenging in these different planes. So it's a spectrum. Um, and it just also an aside, just to give credit where credit's due, Pat Davison helped to take a lot of these ideas and churn them in my brain. Just if anybody uh, is interested in going down a rabbit hole of learning more about this outside of us as well. Uh, Pat had come to the gym, I don't know, what is it? Maybe over, almost two years now, now, Kevin? A year ago? I don't even remember. Um, the first time he it came was over a year ago, probably. probably. Five it was at least over a year ago, but he's been, he's been talking about a bit of this stuff, and I just took some of it and applied it dead onto our system and then elaborated on where I have saw fit, and it's, it just helps to pro me to program for the last, I don't know, two years, three years that I've been sort of thinking like this. So uh, just to give Pat a little credit for kind of his brain on this, uh, it helps for sure. We're getting a lot of questions. I just want to address this. We're getting a lot of questions about specific exercises and specific ah. things to help with the anterior pelvic tilt. So Kevin, would you have okay. anything to say about that <laughs> coming up? Yeah, well, so yeah, let me get through my, I think my presentation can answer some of those. Okay. And then um, it might make them a little bit more clear and then we can kind of dive into it because my, my so, this, yeah. this actually, the reason I like doing presentations with you guys is like, I didn't look at Damien's slides till about 30 minutes before this. And like, it's a perfect segue into the practical conversation that I'm going to do. He did the heavy lifting. Um, and, and then I get to just come in at the end here. So this is ideal. And, and uh, I think that'll kind of answer some of the practical questions that are in the uh, Q and A. So I purposely made this very vague in the practical application point because I would like to not lead you guys to the water. I want to just like give you a map and, and make you figure it out because that's how you're going to be able to apply it yourself. You know, if we just name off some exercises for you guys, like, yeah, sure. It can help your clients, uh, but it's not going to allow you to think critically. So I made this very vague on the application side of things and was very heavy on sort of the establishment of a model. So that way you can take my model or CFSC model or whatever model that you wanna make this and you can tailor it to what equipment you have, what kind of clients you work with, whatever that may be. So functional anatomy as a topic is, is something to be applied. It is not a list of exercises to go do. And I think that is a good point to send Kevin's presentation up here, so. All right. Damn. Whoa! Wow! You like what this? a what you a like start! That? Wow! What a start! It, I you might think that looks fast, but just so you know, if I was going any slower, I'd probably be going backwards. So, <laughs> I was uh, I was there for this photo shoot, and you were moving real slow. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here. I don't know why. Uh, oh, my sharing's paused. It says your sharing is paused. Uh, I don't know why I can't. Uh, this will stop. 
Hold on, I'm gonna stop your screen share and then you can restart. All right, cool. Okay, try it again. I don't know how that happened. Okay, go back into it. Sorry for talking for an hour, by the way. No, don't apologize. That was great. <laughs> All right, good. Good. See it? Yep. All right, cool. All right, so kind of going right from Damien's, I want to take this into a practical conversation as it relates to you guys as coaches and figure out what exercises to choose. And again, I'm not going to tell you what exercises to do, but we want you to understand how to think critically to pay the right exercise for your clients and I think it and uh Damien's presentation really brings up a good point a lot of things that people ignored in college like when they took their kinesiology or the anatomy courses those things really matter like they teach you you know all that basic sometimes mind-numbing anatomy stuff like planes of motion and concentric orientation and eccentric orientation and antagonists and agonists for a reason so that you can pick the right exercises. And it's a lot of times we end up kicking ourselves years later because uh, we didn't pay enough attention in, in those classes. But um, if you need to go back and get a refresher, even after this, go pick up one of those books that he talked about because it will make a lot more sense when you frame it in the practical sense of why you're choosing these exercises. So I think it helps to kind of define functional training because I think often it's one of those things that's bastardized and, and misunderstood. Um, and to me, functional training means we're purposefully selecting exercises to improve some sort of specific outcome. And we're basing those selections on the structure and the function of the human body in that specific outcome. Why are we choosing a single leg deadlift? Why are we choosing a single leg squat? You know, why do we select those exercises? How do they relate to whatever activity we're doing? And like Damien said, I think lots of times if you're running into Google, you're going to get some sort of image back of some sort of circus looking nonsense half the time or Lots of times when there's people who speak out against functional training, usually the power lifter types um, are, are going to say like, oh, it's that silly nonsense, you know, on a BOSU ball or something like that. You know, it, it's not that, right? And, and that is not really what we're looking for. Unless, of course, for them, that's what they're training for, right? In a very specific sense, if you're trying to get better standing on a ball, maybe standing on a ball is functional training and they're practicing that skill. But in the wheelhouse that we're working in as personal trainers in the 80-20, like Brendan said, the specific outcome for our clients is actually very general and that's okay, right? 80, maybe even 90% of the people that come in to see us, whether those are athletes or whether those are general population clientele, like you or me or my parents or grandparents, you know, they want to feel better. They want to improve their movement quality and generally have increases but or maybe we want that for them they want increases of strength and they want improvements in cardiovascular fitness and even if you think you're working with athletes that the generally 80 90 percent of athletes have a fairly low training age so they have very general goals compared to you know the usain bolts of the world or these people who are the top top uh you know, one or two percent in athleticism. The majority of people listening to this webinar are working with people who have general goals, and that's perfectly fine. But that's going to also define what is functional training for those people, because our exercise choices should reflect um, where they are at on their training cycle and what their goals are. Okay. So, like I said, ninety percent of the athletes that come in to see us are operating inside of the box in the middle. Right? They're doing mobility training. You know, generalized mobility training, priming that. Uh, range of motion that they um, and working on general movement skills, general power and speed, hop, jump, bound, and skip, and throwing medicine balls. Um, strength, you know, the boil standard, and, and like these are the categories that Damien talked about earlier: push, pull, hip dom, knee dom, generalized core training, and then some anaerobic. And if if you're doing those things um, and picking from those categories that Damien talked about you're probably hitting the ball out of the park with about 90% of your clients. Um, it's all of the things on the outside that, you know, people on the internet want to talk about and try to say like, this is what you need to do. But those are exceptions to the rule, not the rule. So whether you're dealing with an, an athlete or a client who has anatomical ab abnormalities, things that are different, um, extreme and working at extreme end ranges that reflect the positions that are in their sport right? Working on skill specific training or something that is an individual based activity that's different than the majority of team sports that we see. 
um, unique energy system goals or balance training, like that person wobbling around in the bow suit. These things actually do have applications that could be considered functional training. But I would guarantee out of what is it, 350 people on 350 people on this call, almost all of those 350 people are operating inside the box, not outside. Um, so we're picking the exercises that we pick. Um, so moving along, when we start we'll move and start to talk about functional anatomy instead of just functional training, we always say like most people learn dead person anatomy, something that's based on a cadaver out of a textbook. And, and I think sometimes we say that, unfortunately, with a negative connotation. It's really helpful for learning basic structure. And these are all things, again, that we need to learn. Like uh, uh, Damien just went back and gave us a whole refresher on anatomy and biomechanics 101 because some of us probably slept through that class in college, right? But now we wake up and we're like, oh, shit, I really could have used that education again. So, again, this type of anatomy is important. It's how you learn pination. Like we were talking about why do the fibers go a certain direction? Okay. Why is there fascia or why is there, there that slow transition from red fibers to white fibers? All that stuff matters in rehab. Okay. So you need to have that foundation. What innervates what? It's really valuable to know which nerves go to which muscles and, and what nerve structures those in, insert into. What muscles articulate with one of each other, with, with each other. And then what position and size are these muscles located? When you go to a cadaver lab, it can be really eye-opening to see what position things are in. Okay. However, this doesn't necessarily tell us while they're laying in the supine position on the table, what's going on when that athlete is running or what's going on uh, when that athlete is doing some sort of exercise. It just opens the door to give us a foundation, okay? Functional anatomy, though, um, as an alternative, origin insertion or in-person anatomy is very muscle-specific, right? Functional anatomy is action-specific, Okay. It's telling us what is going on during that action or during that outcome. And that's, what's really important for us selecting exercises. If we're going to prepare that athlete or prepare that client appropriately, functional anatomy tells us what slides. groups of you, what? Sorry. Have you been switching slides? Yeah. Cause yeah, I'm, you're just I'm, stuck on the like title screen. I yeah, don't know we're just stuck on, on the title screen. So if it's cool with you, I'm going to put it on my end. Oh yeah. It, Cause it, it won't let me click my screen, but I'm hitting this, the button and my slides are changing. Oh, it's not, it's not changing for us. So. Uh, it took you guys like eight slides to tell me that. Dude, well, you were random hard. I don't want to take, I don't want to take that, that glory from you. Yeah. I just <laughs> talked for an hour. Come on. <laughs> I thought you were still talking about the first slide. No, no. I, I, I've, oh, I've. Oh, okay. Hold on. Hold on. So instead of hitting play, just go from here because we can see it now. That's really weird. All right, so here are my slides you guys didn't see. That's why I said it's not. <laughs> you guys are killing me here. God. And I, like I said, like most people are in this box. You guys missed all these slides. So that's, no, but that's we were listening bad. to you. I was engaged. That's good. I had you I, I had you hanging off every word. You did. Like I said, this is where I left off. So – Functional anatomy tells us what groups of muscles to do together to create specific actions and specific positions under the force of gravity, right? It tells us, you know, what muscles are working. Like Damien said, when someone's doing that single leg squat, which is the agonist, which is the antagonist, which is the stabilizing muscle, right? Functional anatomy is telling us that. Whereas origin insertion anatomy and cadaver-based anatomy is telling us where the attachments are. Um, and what that muscle does in an isolated setting. Valuable, but not as valuable to helping people improve their function. So let's, I want to go through three basic examples. Um, and these I pulled out of my, my forthcoming book that's being released through Human Kinetics in July of 2020 <laughs> uh, by, the, by the same name of this presentation, Functional Training Anatomy. So I tried to take three basic examples that I think uh, we could talk about as it relates to training both general clients and athletes and how we can improve their function with functional anatomy in mind. So example one, how should we train the hamstring, right? Um, and I think we have to have a basic understanding of um, the hamstring, what, the, what it does and how we, it commonly gets injured in sport. So um, what do we know about hamstrings in sport? Obviously, we have um, three major hamstring muscles, right? We have the semi-tendinous, semi-membranous, and the biceps femoris, both the long head and the short head. Um, just quickly, some facts. The bicep femoris is most commonly injured of all three of those muscles, right? That's the one where we tend to see people uh, with hamstring strains, and that's usually by a long shot. Um, and, and we're going to talk about kind of why that is on the next slide here. So 
that we'll see now that I did this. Oh, there we go. Uh, I'm trying to scroll down. So most commonly we see these biceps, uh, bicep tendon uh, issues. We see these injuries during the terminal swing phase of gait. So if you look at this, I, every single uh, gait phase is this like same drawing of this guy running. I was trying to find a better <laughs> one. But if you look at the number one and number two, this is about where most 90%, I think it is, about of hamstring strains happen in one, number one and number two. And I think commonly people think it's probably, you know, four or five when that hip's going, that foot's going behind the center of mass. But it's almost always right about at foot strike. And if you understand what the hamstring actually does as a muscle, it makes a lot of sense. You know, if you ask someone who just did basic dead person anatomy, they think, oh, the hamstring flexes the knee. That's really not what the hamstring does when we're running. Number one, it has a high eccentric load decelerating the lower leg. As this guy's leg is swinging through um, and it's about to hit the ground to help propel him, we're slowing down the tibia from swinging forward. That, e that hamstring is lengthening under eccentric load. It has huge amounts of eccentric load. But at the same time, it's also stabilizing the pelvis. Damien showed that picture um, of the guy in that broken scissors, that extended posture. The way we help bring that pelvis back underneath us to help get that, um, that core canister lined up, get that pelvis underneath, is using the pelvis to tilt, uh, using the hamstring to tilt the pelvis underneath, right? So think you have a hamstring that's slowing down the lower leg eccentrically during high velocity sprinting. It's also maintaining the position of the pelvis. And then right when that foot hits down, it's got to do its third job. It has to violently help extend that hip to propel you forward, right? So that hamstring has three jobs to do, okay? And I always try to use this analogy. Like if, if I showed up to do this webinar, right, and it was Brendan, Damien, and I, and then Brendan and Damien didn't show up and I had to do it all by myself, I'd be like pissed off and grumpy by the end of it because I had to do three person's job, jobs all on my own, right? That's a hamstring when it gets strain gets a tendonitis because typically the obliques aren't working the way they need to the glutes aren't working the way they need to and your hamstring gets overloaded trying to manage all three of these jobs and it doesn't have its synergists and antagonists helping everything stay in the position where it's supposed to be okay um notice i never talked about a hamstring flexing a knee there because the hit when the this is the, that I, during gait you see uh, up here in step six that's actually almost entirely passive function of the leg passing through and that knee flexing. It's not really because the hamstring is actively flexing the up as much as that's passive lower limb dynamics that cause that knee to flex. But what essentially happens is if we're not maintaining that pelvic position uh, with our obliques um, and we're not helping extend our hip with our glutes, that hamstring tends to get overloaded. And that's when we start to see those things blow up. Okay. So going to that picture, uh, the next picture here, similar to what Damien showed of the pelvic positioning, uh, when they look at all these studies, and I, I can actually, I'll send you the studies to, um, to send out, Brendan, um, and they, they look at all these athletes who have suffered from hamstring strains. Typically, the three biggest findings they see are increased hip flexion, coincidentally also increased anterior tilt, and medial rotation of the knee. And if you look at where the uh, biceps femoris attaches, if we have all three of those things going on, medial rotation, knee is going to put more eccentric strain on the uh, biceps femoris, and an anterior tilt and increased hip flexion is also going to put more eccentric strain on the biceps femoris. Okay, typically these athletes are anteriorly tilted forward, and their and their knees are medially rotated inward. Additionally, they also see reduced biceps femoris activation when compared to the glute on the same side. And one thing we always say is people need more glute activation, need more glute activation. But if you actually look at where these muscles attach, it's pretty clear that the hamstring is actually better suited to extend the hip than the glute is. Like just look at the fibers on the glute. See how they come across here? And it's a big muscle, but it's really more suited to externally rotate the hip than it is to extend the hip. That's not to say that it can't ex extend it. Um, it is a synergist in hip extension, and it's important to help us run forward. But look at the hamstring muscle. I couldn't think of a better muscle to help extend your hip than a hamstring as it runs completely vertically. We talked about the pination of those fibers, okay? What I'm trying to draw the point here is all of these muscles have to work together. You can't just have a hamstring or have a glute or have a oblique. 
for how to for proper functional training that's going to translate to sprinting and translate to sport, we need to think about choosing exercises that train e that train hip extension using the glute and the hamstrings, and thinking about muscle exercises that bring the obliques and pelvic stabilizers into play, so that these muscles and these uh, structures are being changed, trained in concordance with how they're being used when we're running, right? So with explaining that, it should be pretty clear to understand that exercises like this that focus on isolated knee flexion uh, using the hamstring probably don't translate very well to what we're trying to generate uh, training someone for sport. Now, if someone was in a sporting competition where this exact activity was what they were competing in, this could be called functional training. For 99% of the people you see, that's probably not going to be the case, right? Um, whereas if I bring up this buff gentleman here um, and have him do an exercise, okay? <laughs> oh my God. And actually, I'm going to bring the volume. Wow. I actually want the volume so you can hear it. Great. Oh, I can't hear it. Can't hear it. No go. Uh, no go. Bummer. Bummer. Okay, anyways. But what Brendan is saying in this is – you need to have a good hip lift before you can do a leg curl. If you can't get into a hip bridge position, maintaining, he says, keeping your ribs down and keeping your hips extended, you're not going to be able to do a leg curl. Okay. So you see how he has a progression here where he's teaching someone to extend their hips, using their hamstrings, using their glutes, but while also main, maintaining co-activation through his obliques and his abdominals, right? When Damien was just talking about, hey, these muscles are antagonists, right? He's helping to maintain so he can hips and not get an energy leak through his spine, right? All of these little details really matter. Him doing a really crappy hip lift or a, a bad leg curl where he's overextended, that's probably just going to add to the things that are going to cause a hamstring strain rather than prevent one, right? Um, but if done well, he's actually training all of those set. He would also be training when, sp when sprinting, right? If you just go back and see him do that leg curl again, what did he have? Eccentric knee extension. And then hip extension aided by the glutes and antagonized by his obliques and abdominals. Likewise, um, if you see this slightly more buff gentleman doing um, a single leg deadlift here, okay, <laughs> what you see here is the same thing. That lower leg almost looks like he's in term. I say he as if I'm in the third person. Looks like <laughs> I'm in terminal swing phase. Okay, I'm hinging back into the hips. I'm eccentrically training the hamstring. Um, and my violent hip extension through the hamstrings and the glutes and I'm maintaining violent. torso position. So, so it is very violent. So you, but you want to think about, okay, what, what are the activities that I'm trying to improve running? And then what activities that those, those surrounding joints and muscles do I need to train in the weight room to build either control or capacity? Right. Um, so now moving forward, we talk about core muscles. Okay. And I think we always become so focused on just the anterior. If you write core muscles, you only see that picture on the left. You don't often see the picture, the two pictures on the right, whether that's things like your multifidus or your transverse abdominis or pelvic floor or diaphragm, or even less the posterior muscles, um, the back attachments, the oblique serratus, all these things all help make that core canister to create stiffness, right? Um, all of these things I think are in the core, core anatomy bucket. So something to think about when often we hear core training as it relates to sports, people always think rotation, rotation, rotation. And sports live in the transverse plane. Power definitely lives in the transverse plane. But I think it's important to realize the way that these muscles work. Power production as it relates to transverse first force production in sports, that's where the money is. Hitting home runs, Mike Tyson knocking someone out, um, even someone going up for a slam dunk. There's a lot of rotation being controlled, but not necessarily a lot of rotation being produced. Power production isn't nearly as much about producing motion through the trunk as it is about controlling, it, right? Even if you look at both of these pictures, um, while well, Escobar is hitting that home run out, okay, if you notice, he doesn't have a big separation between his hips and his torso. They're actually rotating together, okay? And then you look at Mike Tyson, again, not a huge separation between um, his abdominals and his shoulders. They're rotating together. That's how you produce force. We need to transfer the legs to the hand sports, whether you're punching, throwing, hitting. The force starts in our legs. We're bracing, creating tension, and transferring that through our upper body. We have huge impulse forces with relatively small amounts of motion. 
And I'm not saying there's no rotation of the spine. There clearly is. But it's much less than when people train with exercises like this um, than you would think, right? Is that Marco Sanchez? Uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I hope he's watching. typically we see things like Russian twists and someone thinks like, oh, this is really going to translate to me being able to punch like Mike Tyson. But Mike Tyson's feet are on the floor and he's generating that power through his feet to his hips. Trans, I think the core is not a producer, it's a transducer. We're creating stiffness to help move that force into our hands, right? There is what is moved through um, way, our anti-core training, ways to create stiffness to transfer that force from our lower body to our upper body. So whether that's like what I would call like rotational isometrics, things like a pal-off press or anti-rotation press, things like these active isometrics, pushing into the wall where we're brace, that's really going to translate more effectively to actions like this than something like this. Okay. Here's an even a uh, no back Kevin Carr with short. Um, again, you see yes. producing force. Well, I have to buttress those forces through my spine. Yeah. That is a sharp lineup. Okay. Again, <laughs> old Adidas gear on as well. Again, but what am I trying to do? Damien talked a lot about all the muscles stabilizing and like the uh, frontal plane and transverse plane. I'm stabilizing my pelvis while this force is coming back and forth. I'm stabilizing against those forces to keep my pelvis and my rib cage down, just as we would in sports, all right? Because that's going to allow me to more effectively put the force where I want when I get to some sporting activity. And you see all these basic static patterns, whether that's tall kneeling, standing, half kneeling. But then eventually, we make the athlete earn their way to a dynamic pattern like this, right? But again, you see my pelvis and my shoulders pretty much moving together um and my core being what stabilizes that motion okay again sagittal plane competency is coming first we want to see can that athlete control extension before they do anything else right all of our core training is going to be not necessarily because i'm afraid of that athlete's spine exploding um but more so because i just think it's more effective to teach to create stiffness you have to produce it's very rare we're going to see a sporting activity where the athlete's lower body is fixed and their spine is just corkscrewing back and forth that's not really happens um so i think it's less about you know protecting the spine and more about having effective outcomes in our training um and then the last example i'm going to use is you know what is in single leg stance okay um and i think it's important to realize that once one foot comes off the ground everything changes okay um, and, and if we, we had a little talk before this about like anatomy trains and things like that, and I don't think we're, you know, inherently set up with these magical lines that help us stabilize and that we are made this way to stabilize in certain positions, but these muscle systems are here, um, to help stabilize our pelvis, stabilize our spine, stabilize our hip. Um, and, and we see these, you know, contralateral patterns that we often use, whether it's our adductors to our QL or our, our glute med. Uh, to our obliques and our adductors, we, these are set up to help stabilize our pelvis and space when we're on one leg. And these are things we're not going to utilize as much when we're on two legs. It's just the nature of the movement. There's more stability that has to be uh, dealt with in the frontal and transverse plane. Okay. Most bilateral exercises are going to be sagittally plane dominant, and that doesn't make them bad just makes them sagittally plane dominant. And like I said, for many beginners, that's why we start with the goblet squat. That's why we start with the kettlebell deadlift. That's why we start with box jump, right? Because it allow, it, there's less variables for them to just deal with. It allows them to build basic sagittal plane competencies. But as we start moving to more, to more towards improving athletes for sports and helping people with activities of daily living, our life is lived unilaterally. We're unilateral, contralateral creatures. Everything we do is typically on one leg or with one arm. So we, have, we wanna start, if we're thinking functional training, reflecting those activities, right? Um, so multiplanar forces, okay? it, the, even though the majority of motion when there is doing this rear foot elevated split squat, the majority of his actual motion, if you look from a growth standpoint, is still in the sagittal plane, right? Um, but there's a lot of stability going on is in the transverse and frontal plane, him managing the position of his pelvis. Like Damien said, him aligning himself over his tibia. He has to internally rotate that pelvis on his femur. Likewise, he has to provide an opposing motion, bringing that femur inward, and then he has to stabilize that foot. You don't see any of that motion 
But if he didn't create that stability, he'd collapse or fall over, or you would look at it and be like, oh, that's a really bad looking split squat, right? Doing a split squat well requires him to deal with all these local forces so he can globally move in the sagittal plane and do it the way you want him to do, right? So like I said, everything changes on one leg here. You know, I, Lisa do these lunges globally her movement is still in the sagittal plane but if she doesn't stabilize through her adductors and her obliques uh, and her QL and her glute need then she's going to flop over side to side okay um, you know we, the value of doing all these single leg exercises is building local stability in the frontal and trans, transverse plane and doing them well you know position dictates function we always say okay I need you to line your nose up over your toes and your foot because that gets their pelvis over their femur, their femur over their tibia, and their tibia over their foot. And that's really inherent in value is in single leg training that you don't necessarily get out of doing some of these other bilateral movements. Um, and I think it's important to think about what am I getting on a local standpoint, not global standpoint, because it's asking these athletes to use all these muscles they might not use otherwise. Um, I, see, I tried to keep it short because I knew Daniel would be long. Um, recommended reading. I couldn't recommend this first book anymore. Like I still go back when people ask me for an anatomy book, Physiology of the Foundations for Rehabilitation by Donald Newman. I have like an old ratty version. It's like the second time I've had it. I completely destroyed the first one. I still refer to it all the time. It's probably the best like functional anatomy book that I, I think you could use as far as understanding what goes on at the joints. Um, Tom showed Human Locomotion. Uh, conservative gait related disorders. If you want to learn, someone was talking about uh, gait analysis to understand what happens when we run. He breaks down pretty uh, thoroughly, like what muscles are being used, where and why, uh, when we run, when we walk, and then some of the disorders and how you can deal with those. And then so one book that was really foundational for me early on is uh, Shirley Saruman's Diagnosis and Treatment of Movement Impairment Syndromes. And some of the things um, might be dated, some of the things, um, you know, might be kind of like outside of your scope if you're not a PT, but then also I think it gives you a big picture perspective of things like agonists and antagonists, some of the stuff that Damien talked about um, to help make decisions. So those three books, we'll put those in there and I will also include all the references from the slides as well. I have PDFs of all the research, so I'll send those over to Brendan. All right. Well done. Hold on. I'm answering one question. Hey, you're welcome. You forgot your own book. When's that coming out? My book, my book, my book Functional Training Anatomy uh, <laughs> by Kevin Carr will be available through Human Kinetics in July of 2020. That is the, the proposed schedule as of now. So wow. uh, look out for that one. Same time yep. as and we will be great. Yeah. And so we'll be, uh, we'll be going through essentially all the exercises that we use at Mike Boyle Strength Conditioning. And it was really perfect the way Damien set his up because the first chapter in the book really talks about planes of motion, uh, putting the exercises into categories. Then we go through all the exercises, everything from mobility through warm up, through power, strength training. And at the end, we put them in a program builder in the last chapter. So it'll be kind of based on this exact conversation. So uh, very excited for that. Sweet. All right. Well, uh, number one, I'm going to send everyone this article that you wrote, Kevin, actually the first article you ever wrote for uh, movement as medicine a very long time ago, probably six years ago, training to prevent hamstring injuries. So this will answer probably 50% of the questions we got in the Q and a, and it's actually a bunch of your slides that you just went through hamstring anatomy, hamstring function, the mechanics. So pelvic positioning. Uh, that slide you just had, but then it goes through a bunch of the exercises for everyone. So we've got 90-90 breathing to restore pelvic alignment, single leg deadlift, the leg curls with all the videos, movement integration, skipping drills, sled pushing and dragging. So I will include that as well in uh, the slides that we send out. Uh, I, as you were going through your presentation, I was like, this looks very familiar. And it's that article you wrote almost six years ago. No, uh, that way people get videos and stuff too. Um, I also couldn't let you awesome. only uh, be the only two with slides, so I made one. Oh, great job! <laughs> I, I had to get in here somehow. I didn't want to sit in the background. Um, so uh, I, I in my 
checklist uh, my checklist product I have a this looks a lot like that slide and I think what's really really helpful for people to understand the difference between what we would call functional training versus what people do in the gym is the trap bar deadlift not just a functional leg press exercise so if I take Kevin here and I flip him over and I made my own little uh, imaginary leg That's press <laughs> here on keynote and you can see really Kevin, it, if I flip him over it is just a leg press except it's a leg press that you're standing up so you have more freedom of motion of the spine and hips because when you do a leg press on your back here his like Damien was saying when you're supine on the ground you don't have as many options there and if he's missing hip or ankle mobility where's he going to get it from it's going to come from the lumbar spine so if you're at least missing hip and ankle mobility in a trap bar deadlift you can at least adjust your hip height or change the height of the trap bar you get more setup options and positioning options with the trap bar you now get grip training you don't get grip training when you do a leg press you get upper back engagement which you don't get in a leg press you get core engagement so now we're talking about all of our anatomical uh, functioning and all of our anatomy you get neurological skeletal and cardiovascular right because now we got to pump blood from the feet up to our heart because now we're in standing as opposed to lying down so i would deem kettlebell and trap bar deadlift to be more optimal for the transfer to sport life or what we would call fitness and performance so if you gave me an option, I would always pick goblet squat over a Smith machine squat. And I would always pick trap bar deadlift over a leg press or leg extensions or leg curls for that reason. Now, that's not to say that you can't do those things. I'm just saying if I only have an hour to train with you, there's a more optimal option that's going to have more benefit based off of functional anatomy than putting you on a machine. A machine might be where somebody has to start if they have a handicap or an injury or they're just beginning. I get that. Totally fine. People will fight that to the death. What I'm saying is, is there's a better option for you to choose. Um, so that's, I wanted to share that with, because I think it helps visually to understand the difference between what we would call gym training or health club training versus what we call functional training. Well, I think there's also just a little bit of nuance to pick apart just what you said a little bit. There's functional anatomy and there's functional training, right? So we can apply the concepts of functional anatomy to our training modality. But if you just want to go mash on hack squat and leg press because you're a bodybuilder and you just want to build your legs and you don't care about your, your health and function on that side of things, then like that is an option. You can choose to go do that. And you can apply those functional anatomy concepts to that, that same application. So this yeah. goes to any coach, whether they like powerlifting or bodybuilding or functional training as we choose to do with our clients for ourselves, you can apply these baseline concepts and then fit it into whatever bucket you want to fill. I would think uh, Arnold's, Arnold Schwarzenegger's Encyclopedia of Modern Bodybuilding does a great job of that because he uses – your functional anatomy terms is essentially yeah. you just laid it's out not new for yeah. each, but he does it for bodybuilding exercises uh, and what i love about arnold is that he was very well rounded he didn't only live in the sagittal plane he did all the planes he just did it in a way that we like you, you're saying is optimal for bodybuilders but not a lot of us train bodybuilders for a living to make money uh, we train people who want to be healthy or have expensed their health in order to make enough money to pay yeah. Yeah. for personal trainers. Bodybuilders usually train themselves because they train twice a day, six days a week for two and a half hours. They don't pay personal trainers. Um, okay, so Joel Anderson asks, so what, what is functional anatomy? And both of you answered this in the beginning. Uh, since the word functional is thrown around a lot, what determines something is functional? I think we've answered that as well. Uh, <clears throat> how can I use functional anatom anatomy? I can't see that word because my... <laughs> how can I use functional anatomy to design better exercise oh, programs for my clients? So 
I think that comes down to maybe that chart that I had kind of put up, right? So it just, it's a matter of, of picking buckets to fill, right? So if, if your client is not some spring chicken who needs to go, you know, go play sports and do all sorts of fancy stuff, then you don't need to build a lot of competency with transverse plane activity. I mean, it might be good for them to throw a med ball every once in a while, but you know, for their life, they just need to be strong and pretty stable in the sagittal plane. And you can build around that. But if you have that same person come in and goes, Hey, I want to be a golfer now. I've never golfed in my life. Well, now the program you build for them is going to have to incorporate some of these aspects of functional anatomy that you now hopefully have a better grasp of to say, well, frontal plane muscles are going to be things like obliques and frontal plane muscles are going to be things like adductors and glute med. I can make sure that I build their capacity in these muscles so that it, they can apply it to the, whatever it is they want to do. Yeah. I think um, when you're building a program, ask yourself a few questions. like, the function that I want to improve. Like Damien said, if it's someone who's going to, you know, Hey, I just want to like go to work and sit in my chair. I'm not really going to do anything. Maybe those, you don't have to improve that much in those planes. Ask yourself, what are the muscles and joints doing during that function? Again, when, if there's someone who's going to play golf, like Damien said, it's going to be much more transverse and frontal plane. And then how can I progressively improve control and capacity in those tissues that will improve that function? And that's how, that's our progression regression sheet, right? We, we found a progressive way to look at things in the, in the transverse plane, the sagittal plane, in a hip dominant, D dominant, push, pull, core, whatever it might be. So you just have to ask yourself these programming questions and then look at the anatomy that that leads you to. Um, I, again, I just think functional, like they, people said, there's a lot of people saying like, what is functional training? What does this mean? It's purposeful. Like, are you connecting the dots back to what your intended outcome is? And if you have a grasp on the anatomy, it makes that a lot easier to do. How do you view it in the context of acute slash chronic injury rehab? That everything is interconnected. Yeah, and and I think, you know, all that means is like, I remember us, Brendan, you and I discussing like the thing that Mike said when he first started doing the type of training that we do. He said he watched a lot of PTs and said, well, why don't I just do this stuff proactively instead of reactively? In, in his idea of like doing mobility work and, you know, doing like what we call prehab or doing things that, you know, prevent injuries. Like we talked about hamstring training. Okay. All the chronic and cr acute rehab means is that you're getting them back to where they were. Most of the stuff that we do in rehab is also the stuff we do in training. So it's very hard, I think, to separate it. You're just probably starting a little bit further back. Yeah, you just have more regressions for a rehab mm -hmm. or further regressions. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think this question has like seven questions laced underneath it, right? If we're thinking acute to chronic, like that's a workload problem. So the primary purpose of us having this conversation today was to take away things like volume and load and intensity and really just focus in on what is the body doing in space? Because things like that factor into it, acute to chronic injuries are going to be overload, which oftentimes is going to be too much load or too much time under tension or too much volume of training, which is a little outside of the, the functional anatomy application. Obviously, acute to chronic injury rehab stuff is going to factor into our decisions surrounding it. But if, if they're a runner, they're going to be completely overflowed with things like running activity so it's going to be a bunch of just footfalls over and over and over again so in regards to our choices in rehab we're not going to have them do a lot of things that are going to keep filling that bucket because they already have a lot of it so you're going to choose things that are just pretty much like all right you know i'm just gonna have them do like a lot of basic core activities and planks and if we think about Kevin's slide with the sprinter of having their pelvis tip forward and long hamstrings and a lot of hamstring strains, it's like, well, let's get their hamstrings to shorten up a little bit. Let's get their abs to turn on and, and to fire in a different position. So I think this sort of, sorry, Go ahead, Brendan. Go ahead. Say this, this question also makes me think that it, or 
reminds me of how important it is to have a movement screen and that you're using movement as a gauge to make decisions because you, you showed earlier, Damien and Kevin, you showed the hamstrings, right? If your hamstring is injured, why is it injured? Not like, okay, like let's rub your hamstring and make your hamstring stronger. If you are in a ton of anterior pelvic tilt and your rib cage is open and you run with your arms out and your knees out and your run, your mechanics aren't good. Like you could, you could work on that hamstring and make that hamstring as strong as you want to make it. But if you don't fix the platform on which the hamstring attaches to, it doesn't matter. You have to fix the rib cage and pelvis first and the diaphragm and the deep inner core muscles, then the hamstring won't get hurt again. Um, so this, this question for me too also brings up the, the importance of having a movement screen or looking through exercises through the functional anatomy lens, as opposed to just like, oh, your hamstring hurts, like let's rub your hamstring and ice it and make your hamstring stronger is generally not the answer. Yeah. Yeah. And I think Sean just popped into the Q and A with a good question that we can maybe tag along to this concept that we're kind of evolving into. Uh, he's like, Hey, I'm with it. I think in the adult setting, a lot of people, the primary requests for many of our clients are going to be, I just want to look better. I want to, you know, grow muscles. Uh, and he, you know, acknowledges, Hey, there's going to be a lot of nutrition and habit aspects of this. But if we think about through this, the lens of functional anatomy, I talked about it a bit during my presentation. What are going to be our big movers? What's going to allow us to gain some size? If we're looking to gain some weight, we're looking to get bigger. We're going to have to move bigger weights over time. And how are we going to do that? Probably with some just basic sagittal plane activity, right? Get really strong in a squat, get really strong in a deadlift, get really strong in a bench press or a dumbbell bench press and gain a degree of competency in the basic big movements because that's what's going to get you to gain muscle. You're not going to gain muscle doing IYs T's like although that may help might help to get some activation going and like and turn on some muscles for you. Those are only going to be the side dish to your main training dish which is going to be your priority of putting on muscle to help you look better in the in the mirror when you wake up in the morning. You know, so I, I think that the functional anatomy approach is still applies. It still just comes down to looking. It depends on the lane that you want to evaluate it from of if I want to gain muscles, I got to move big weights and those big weights are going to come down to the positions and the planes and the patterns that have the bigger muscle groups in them. Um, and then every, outside of that, then it's just volume decisions, right? It's like, all right, if they're trying to gain muscle, it might be more volume. If they're trying to gain strength, it's less volume and just max out on weights, but it's still going to be the same muscle groups. That's a great question. I like that, Sean. Thank you. Very good. Like that. I want to go off script for a second because. Oh no. When I read a lot of those questions, there was lots and lots of fascial sling questions and we're getting a bunch of fascial sling questions right now. Uh, would I be wrong to say that fascial sling training is just following your transverse plane your functional your patterns and right it's just another word for training patterns training uh planes of movement or training fascial slings there's no difference it's just the word that anatomists and fascial researchers like to use which is fascial slings we call it movement patterns or we call it planes of movement or and there's no difference. It's just the word that we use. Would you guys agree with that statement? Yeah. I mean, I think everything's a model, right? It's just like you fall into whatever model that you happen to have come up through. Right. So it's like, if you're an athlete and your coach tells you how to practice and do your sport and play the game, that's the model you're used to. And then if you get traded to a new team, you're like, what is this shit? Like, I don't know how any of this works because it's a new model that you're now in. Same thing with us. Like we have a model of looking at things and just, all right, bi bilateral stance, sagittal plane. We're going to do a push, a pull. It's going to be horizontal. It's going to be whatever it is. This is just our classification model. Right. And then the anatomy trains and the anatomy slings and things like that. Although I've, I mean, I've read the book, I've watched the videos, I've done 
the baseline amount of learning and to a, absorb some of that model, I just don't think it fits too heavily in a, a training approach because muscles move bones and anat just the, the fascia that encompasses everything is obviously a, a big part of it. Yeah. But it's probably just focused on a little bit too much because that's just stretch shortening cycle at the end of the day. The muscles are, are doing a lot of work. So it's just a model though. I mean. And to Kevin's dead anatomy point and your point about the slings is the dead anatomy and Kevin, you said this dead anatomy is a wonderful place to start. Slings are a wonderful place to start because it gets the conversation started. But this is where you were talking about uh, Damien and the, your first slide was you have to go in depth on these things to understand where they're coming from because the body doesn't move in just slings. Everything's connected to everything. So yep. it, it, when I do a bicep curl, okay, yeah, my bicep did something. Well, you said my tricep had to kick off, right? My, my core had to kick on so that it didn't fall flat on my face. Uh, my, my paraspinals and my posterior chain had to kick on to make sure I didn't fall over or didn't fall back. Like there's just so many more things that go into it that, but you have to know your anatomy, your insertions, yeah. uh, your origins in order to have that conversation. So having your basics or your fundamentals gets you into the conversation to go more in depth. But if you don't have those things, it's a really hard conversation for us to have. So you have to know dead anatomy first before you can go into functional anatomy, essentially. For sure. Yeah, and all I, of these, it's, all of these are convenient models to help you learn the next thing. And that's why we always talk about like, I say, go take that course, go take that course, go take that course, because you'll see where the Venn diagram overlaps to help you learn the big picture, right? And like, whether that's anatomy trains, or whether that's, you know, learning what our boil system is, or learning, you know, the stuff that you learn in PRI, all of a sudden you see, oh, they're all talking about the same things from a different viewpoint that help you get the big picture. What's the George boxes is that all models are wrong right? Some are just more useful. So if you, if you start to learn a lot of different models, then it makes the picture more clear for, for that practitioner when they get there. Joe made a good point. Um, and I see what he's saying now. Uh, just because you know, a, just because you know, functional anatomy doesn't mean you can diagnose. It does not make you a medical professional. I see where he's going here. I, I didn't understand it first, Joe, but now I do. Uh, you, I'd like to touch on this. You need, to know, you need to know when to refer out to a PT or a doctor or a Cairo when something's not in your wheelhouse. Uh, I will say that there are times when you will get people who are injured or who are working with an injury professional or with a rehab a rehabilitation professional, and you need to know your functional anatomy. So it works both ways, but I don't want anyone to think that like, just because you understand functional anatomy, now it makes you a doctor where you can diagnose that is not true. Uh, but you do need to know these things in order to work hand in hand with those people. Damien. Well, it, so on the other side of that, I would say that a lot of physical therapists have a bad reputation with strength coaches and trainers because they address the human being in a not in a very non-functional way. They go in with a hamstring injury and all they do is just do hamstring stuff. And then all of a sudden they, I mean, many clients come to Kevin, come to me. They're like, I was at PT for eight weeks and nothing helped. And then you started training my abs more and I feel better. Or, you know, that's just a random, you know, analogy there. But I, I would say that this learning, this stuff that I'm talking about here, no, it does not give you a, a diagnosis, like a, the tools to diagnose people and, and fix everyone. But what it does do is it gives you a voice to make decisions as you go and to know when it is appropriate that something's out of your wheelhouse to refer it out. Um, but I just wanted to give the, the kind of opposite side of that because PTs have just as bad of a reputation with many trainers on yeah. the other side of it. Well, and, so. and PTs just look at in Kairos and AT, they, they look at micro, they don't look at macro. They're, Again, I don't want to lump everyone together, but many of them only look micro, whereas trainers, there's many trainers who only look macro. Correct. So trainers need to learn how to be more micro and 
PTs need to learn how to be more macro, in my opinion, as a general whole of the professions. And the professions need to work yeah. together as uh, collaborators, not competition. Well, and that's where I think, like, you know, more PTs are coming to look at things like these webinars and learn more training concepts, just as we're trying to educate trainers to know a little bit more about what the PTs have spent, you know, a doctorate going to get, right. or, you know, me going to grad school to go further into biomechanics or something like that. It, it takes someone to meet at the middle. Good. Um, so <clears throat> the question was, Single leg deadlift to stabilize the pelvis. Uh, Kevin, I believe this was your lateral subsystem slide. So when you stand on one leg, you've got adductor, QL, and glute med, and many other things working. Yeah, I mean, you're going to have uh, many of the same things working during a single leg squat or a split squat. I mean, the same things we think about during a single leg deadlift. And the reason we teach a cross-reaching single leg deadlift is to promote internal rotation of the pelvis we're doing that we're stabilizing through the glute med we're using the adductor to help pull our pelvis into internal rotation we're using our oblique to try to center ourselves over our femur our hamstring is eccentrically being loaded you know so again it's in single leg stance many of the same muscles are being used which ones are being more targeted from a uh, agonist standpoint uh, is what's going to change it from knee dominant to hip dominant, right? Uh, a hinging exercise, the hamstring is going to be more of the, the agonist, whereas a knee dominant exercise, the quad is going to be the agonist. But the same stabilizing muscles are typically working around the pelvis to keep everything in check. And, and that's why single leg training, I think, is so valuable. Uh, I liked this question was the... <clears throat> connecting the sites of pain with the actual problem. Um, so like, yeah, you have a neck problem, but right. Is it coming from your shoulder? You have low back pain. Is it coming from your rib cage and pelvis? So again, I think we, you both did a great job of explaining that just because your hamstring is tight, it's not necessarily that it's tight or that it's painful. It could be that your rib cage and pelvis are in the wrong position. Uh, now for us to sit here and, try to tell you why that is. There's just so many reasons, right? So your low back pain could be a uh, positioning of the rib cage and pelvis problem. It could be an actual disc issue. It could be a loading issue. It could be a, a biomechanics, how you move issue. Like there's just so many things for th that we would need 10 webinars just on <laughs> one injury or, or one movement in order to break that down. Um, but the idea being that this is the joint by joint approach, right? Like if your hips don't move and your shoulders and your T-spine don't move, the lower back is gonna have to do more of the work. If your ankle's too stiff and your hips are stiff, your knee is gonna have to do most of the work. Like Kevin said, there's three of us on here, and if two of us dropped off, one person's gonna be left holding the bag and having to do all of the work, and that person's gonna probably get pretty pissed off and find its way in, in inflammation and injury. So anything you two wanna add there, good? That's great. I, I yeah. threw this one in here as a uh, as a, a personal question that I like to answer is assessing and diagnosing poor foot or ankle function. Um, what are the common issues that are up the chain? Uh, almost everything um, when your your ankle doesn't move because it's the first thing that hits the ground. My big my big uh, I guess pet peeve might be that a lot of people spend a ton of time on the foot and the toes and the ankle and they don't look at the rib cage and pelvis. If you are running or lifting on a, what we would call broken rib cage or pelvis, where you're overextended, your anterior pelvic tilt, you can do all the foot stuff you want. It's not gonna help because if you don't adjust, so I personally, and I, we spoke about this with Michael Mullen, Kevin, I work from the middle out, rib cage and pelvis first, because that's the platform on which these things sit on top of, yes, Good, work the foot, work the ankle, uh, work the hand, work the wrist. But again, if you are pressing overhead and you're broken here and your wrists are like this, like you've got to fix the limitations in the shoulder and the thoracic spine first before the wrist is going to be able to take a break. Um, so I, 
I like foot and ankle work, but again, you've got to work, in my opinion, from the inside out while addressing those things on the side. I don't know if you want to add, either of you want to add anything. Yeah, I was saying like a, a big part of our practice in movement is medicine. I, I never thought I'd treat so many lower leg issues. Um, and when I tend to see frontal plane issues in the lower leg, I tend to see frontal plane issues in the hips. And when I tend to see sagittal plane issues in the lower leg, I tend to see sagittal plane issues in the pelvis and hips. Meaning when I see an Achilles or a calf or heel spur issue, there's usually sagittal plane stability issues up the chain. Because if you think about what happens to the pelvis, what happens to the hamstrings, that goes down to the calf, goes down in the foot. Um, when you tend to see uh, lateral ankle and medial foot issues as well, you tend to see people who have trouble stabilizing their pelvis when their foot hits the ground. And that's a generalization, but I, I've come to see that issue. And usually you address the symptom locally and then improve the stability globally. Um, and really, really common, like Brendan said, very rare when you see an isolated issue that is just uh, active at the, at the foot or at the ankle. And lots of times that's a volume programming issue in my experience. Like, hey, I haven't been running and I just went and ran 10 miles for the first time. Well, maybe that's why your lower leg hurts. But lots of times it's because there's something going on up the chain. Yeah, you guys just crushed that here. That's good. <laughs> Oh, Damien, you, you address All right. it. You, you want to so, do it? Yeah. Go all right. right. I have, I have one thing that I need to start with from an anonymous attendee. Okay. How can you apply slash implement functional anatomy and biomechanics with psychosocial model of pain science and approaches? Does pain mean there's something wrong biomechanically? All right. So I don't know if that's, an anonymous attendee who's my friend who knows some of my triggers, or if it's an anonymous attendee who knows what answers might start to come out. But this is a complicated model. So this is number one, why Arnold Schwarzenegger was the cover photo of my, my presentation, because I know that things are very complicated in this world of exercise. So Arnold Schwarzenegger being a cybernetic organism does not have to worry about you know, his mom yelling at him before he left the house and his quality of movement. So that is through the lens of this functional anatomy stuff, why we both spoke the way that we did very objectively and sort of biomechanical in nature. Um, in regards to pain science and all that sort of stuff, and I brought this up along with the powerlifting question there because I think they both sit hand in hand. Um, if you are a power lifter, and you are totally okay with just going in the deepest, darkest, sagittal plane sort of realm that you can get, it's probably pretty expected that you might run into some pain and problems just because you are specializing in a very specific pattern of movement, right? You're, you're doing the same things repetitively and it's in the same positions, just you as it would be. the me. same argument for running, playing. That's what I was just going to say with me as a runner. It's just like, I'm doing the same crap over and over again. I'm just doing it's It's all specialization at the end of the day. Specialization is probably going to infer some sort of problem. Right. And the, the talk with biopsychosocial kind of concepts is going to be, you know, what is pain from like a philosophical philosophical sense and like, I mean, what is anything that we do? We're just kind of like a brain floating in our heads and everything is just sensory perception. So from that model, yeah, yeah, pain is just something that is kind of going on in our brain. And you can, if you're just a complete like sagittal monster and you're like, I don't care, I'm just gonna go squat, you can you can get along just fine. But from an application sense and, and a whole perspective of having a model based around movement, there's you can't just throw biomechanics out the window because you, you read a few philosophy papers about pain. Like you have to acknowledge that there's just bad biomechanical applications to things and that you have to acknowledge that people do move badly or people move well. Like if somebody just stepped up to the plate of an MLB game and they just said, biomechanics doesn't matter. I'm going to hit this ball however I want it to. Like clearly there's the better way to do it and there's a not better way to do it. And so that is where I think all of this meets in the middle is that 
there is the philosophy of pain stuff and then there's the biomechanics of movement and they meet somewhere in the middle. And so if you're a power lifter and you want to squat a thousand pounds, you're probably going to run yourself into some pain or problems because you're specializing to a very high degree and you can choose to ignore that pain and just like keep it hammering. If we look at the, you know, scans of somebody's low back, like I probably have a disc out and like my labrum's probably torn on both sides because I've been running hard for like 10 years or whatever. It doesn't matter. There's definitely some biomechanical problems that happen with everybody. And so it comes down to the application of all of this lens that we look through today as just a way of classifying and quantifying movement so that you can know what you're doing with your clients. If you just want to do squat bench deadlift with your clients, or you just want to do running with your clients, or you want to do whatever you can choose to do that. And you have to acknowledge the, the biopsychosocial side of things. But I mean, that's what we do. I think Kevin, you had went to a bio, uh, like a, a pain science course, correct. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you came back and you were like, yeah, talk to your clients and have good conversations. Like that's what we do every day. Exactly. That's what I we might. do as, that's what we do as trainers. Like that's what I go, I bullshit with my clients for eight hours a day and I have a great time doing it. But the application of all of this functional anatomy and biomechanics, it sits in the background of everything that we do. So I think it, it meets in the middle there. That is my rant. That was perfect. Well done. All right. Last two questions and we're done. You have an option okay. either. What is the biggest misconception regarding functional anatomy as it relates to training? Or what's the greatest advantage of knowing functional anatomy compared, compared to just knowing gross anatomy? I know we discussed some of it, but I think it's a good way to end. Uh, I mean, um, I think yeah. the biggest misconception is that like, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to be as like Charlie always says, golfish. Uh, like you're trying to replicate the exact movement when yeah. you're training, like, like Damien just used the example of swinging a baseball bat. Like well, I'm not taking a guy in there and like swinging a weighted bat off the Kaiser because it's the exact same motion. Cause you're going to get diminishing returns. What we're trying to think is like, what are the muscles doing during that motion and how can we train them more effectively in the weight room? We're not trying to re replicate the skill that's being done out on the field. That's why they go to practice every day. Um, but we're trying to prepare them to do that skill better and prepare them physically with general qualities that are going to be translated to that specific activity. And the benefit of knowing functional anatomy is that you can then select exercises in the weight room that will do that, that don't try to replicate what they do. Because if I go to swing a weighted baseball bat, the amount of loads is very limited um, that, that before that athlete gets hurt or it starts to affect their output on the field. Um, or, or like if Damien was like, oh, I'm just going to throw a weighted vest on when I go running. That should translate to improve my running. No, he's probably better off doing single leg squats and doing things in the weight room that are going to support his running. So if you understand anatomy, then you can, you're going to be better off selecting exercises um, within the weight room to support your activity. Bam. Mic drop. Damien, you want to add anything? No, I got nothing, man. All right, cool. So before we leave, just so everyone has our contact information, there's mine, Kevin's, Damien's. Uh, we're still offering 150 off the CFSC, 50% off of my exercise checklists. Um, again, appreciate everyone being here. Thanks for spending time with us. Next week, a reminder, we have how to read research, and I will send out, Damien, you have picked out a research article. Yeah, I'll send you a few things. I have a, a few things to send you, so okay. I'll give you that so tomorrow. I will send that out to everybody before next week so everyone can read the article and then we can go through how to read research. Um, that's it. That's all I got. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Bruno, all of our friends down in Brazil. Thank, Thank you, guys. you, everybody. Appreciate it. Take care, guys. Bye. Later. Thank you so much.